Welcome to The Mutant Menace Presents Deconstructing Powers of Ten, where we get to spend some time digging into the details of this new era for the X-Men. I'm Cody, and today we'll be looking at Powers of Ten, Issue 1 by Jonathan Hickman, R.B. Silva, Adriana Di Benedetto, Marte Gracia, and Clayton Cowles. <laughs> Powers of Ten Issue 1 introduces us to four distinct eras that, appropriately enough, are designated into Powers of Ten, which is the number 10 multiplied by itself a certain number of times. By definition, the number 1 is the zeroth power of 10, which is why our Year 1 is designated as 10 to the zeroth power. The progression of our timeline breaks down this way. 10 to the zeroth power, Year 1, The Dream. 10 to the first power, Year 10, The World. 10 to the second power, Year 100, The War, and 10 to the third power, Year 1000, Ascension. For the purposes of this video, we'll be covering these eras in chronological order, and we'll be referencing the dossiers for insight into what it all means. 10 to the zeroth power, Year 1, The Dream. Honestly, it's unclear exactly where this era takes place. We won't see any X-Men in these pages, but since it's referred to as Year 1, we can assume that the events in this era will be the ones that take us into Year 10, the time which House of X Issue 1 dropped us into. A celebratory mood opens this era in what looks like a carnival or a fair. Charles Xavier moves through the crowd before quietly having a seat on a bench overlooking the festivities. He gazes into the sky as birds fly in a perfect circle above him. The appearance of these white, dove-like birds in conjunction with the merriment of our setting evokes thoughts of freedom and peace, and their circular flight communicates a continuous cycle. There is an almost quizzical expression on his face as he watches them. Or is it a focused one? Is he exerting influence over these birds? Over any of the rest of the festivities? His gaze is broken by the arrival of who we assume to be Moira McTaggart, who confesses that the celebration feels like a distraction from what's really going on. Now we're being encouraged to question the validity of this fair, and immediately begin to feel like there's something we're unaware of. Charles admits to having a great day, and Moira begins to detail the things she's seen at the fair. The caged beasts, the games of chance, and the fortune teller selling his wares. It is here that we see figures arranged on three major arcana of the tarot, and we'll definitely come back to those later on in this video. Moira explains that she found what she's been looking for in Charles Xavier, the strong man, and wondered why, sitting there under parted skies and brilliant sun, this strong man was smiling. This is a seemingly contradictory thing to wonder, as parted skies and brilliant sun are almost always attributed to positivity and good vibes. Why would someone wonder why Xavier was smiling unless they knew that this wasn't the idyllic day it appeared to be? Xavier explains that he's had a dream of a better world and his place in it. Moira tells him that it's not a dream if it's real. It is here we learn that Charles doesn't seem to have any idea who this woman is, even though she says they go way back. She invites him to read her mind, and we bear witness to what Marvel has long teased as the most important scene in X-Men history, before our title page hits us right in the face. Are we to assume that what follows in this issue is what Charles is learning? Is he seeing the future play out? Or will we be returning to this sunny festival in an upcoming issue? For now, we move right on into 10 to the first power, year 10, the world. This is the era of Krakoa introduced to us in House of X issue 1. Mystique and Toad arrive on Krakoa following their heist of contested storage from that issue. Mystique is seen taking a flash drive into the House of M, where Magneto awaits news of success. Mystique refuses to hand over the flash drive, insisting that she has further demands, suggesting that she, Toad, and Sabretooth may have been hired hands in this operation. She tells Xavier that helping her fellow mutants is not enough, and Xavier says that they have demands as well, before taking the flash drive from her and explaining that everyone living in this better world they're building owes something, suggesting that the freedom and peace they're experiencing comes at a price. Now we move into where the bulk of this issue takes us. 10 to the second power, year 100, the war. This is the era we seem to be inevitably coming to. Events that will take place in these pages feel like a progression of themes introduced in House of X Issue 1, in which humans are working together with machines to outlive the mutants. Orcus is not mentioned by name, but since their operations were clearly built around the synthesis of man and machine against the mutants, we can infer their involvement in the beginnings of what we'll see here. Our scene opens with mutants being hunted by humans working with machines in a place called the Nexus. As one mutant dies, another is examined and identified as Silabel a black brain telepath described as a natural Judas with subversion written into her DNA. 
This is because Silabel was among the last hounds bred in the kennel, a facility created by the Man-Machine Alliance to produce sentinel mutants that would locate and integrate with mutant communities before turning on them in service of the Man-Machine Alliance. However, many ended up defecting to join the mutant cause as a result of being bred for such betrayal. We see Silabel has built a close alliance and kinship with the mutants Rasputin and their priest companion, telepathically saying that she was a nameless killer before being taken in by them. Silabel tells them that this infiltration of the Nexus was too important for them to stick around and save her, and that they should retreat now. The priest agrees, and Rasputin says that just because he was bred a coward doesn't mean she was. She said this because the priest is a cardinal, a third generation outlier of Mr. Sinister's mutant breeding program that was a response to mutant kind's constant evasion, relocation, confrontation cycle. The mutants bred in this program were made to serve different militaristic and tactical purposes on Mars and sent to defend Krakoa before it fell. Looks like this story is definitely a progression of the foundations laid in House of X issue number one, and that mutants' own actions will lead them to some pretty dire consequences down the road. The first generation of the Sinister line were clones of a singular DNA source and referred to as fodder in the breeding pits of Mars. Did the opening sequence in House of X issue one take place on Mars in one such breeding pit? Could those have been copies of Jean and Scott, after all? Subsequent generations in the Sinister line were called Chimera class for being hybrids of various DNA sources. The second generation was made up of mostly predictable combined power sets of two source mutants. The third generation were hybrids of five X genes and proved very effective against the man-machine supremacy, but produced significantly more outliers, which was the designation given to products of a predictable failure rate that increased with every generation. Rasputin and Cardinal are both of the third generation, but where Rasputin displayed efficiency as a hybrid of DNA samples from Quentin Quire, Pyotr Rasputin aka Colossus, Eunice the Untouchable, Kitty Pride, and Laura Kinney aka X-23, Cardinal was an outlier. Outliers of the third generation are made up almost entirely of pacifist mutants with an obsession with creation myths. They are spiritual beings who refused individual names, commonly being referred to as Cardinals. In our world, Cardinals are nominees of the Pope that form the Sacred College, which elects succeeding Popes. Again, Hickman is throwing a lot of religious subtext right at us. And finally, the fourth generation. Fourth generation was made with Omega-based samples and shared a hive mind that was unfortunately corrupt, making the entire batch defective. But this was not known until they destroyed 40% of the mutant population, causing the fall of Krakoa before committing mass suicide and collapsing Mars. It is widely believed that Sinister himself betrayed the mutant race due to a secret self-interest, and the fall of Krakoa may not have been as much of a mistake as once thought. He was publicly executed by the man-machine supremacy after defecting. Still insisting upon retreat, Cardinal plants a black seed of Krakoa to grow a gateway that will facilitate their escape into the No Place, while Rasputin charges in to save Silabel. Failing, she joins Cardinal as Silabel is captured by the Man-Machine forces. Despite this, it appears the mutants got what they came for, as they report their mission's success to familiar faces within No Place. It is here we get our first glimpse into the rest of the survivors of the war with the Man-Machine forces. There are two major colonies of surviving mutants. Benevolence is in Shi'ar space, and a colony based on Shandalar, the Shi'ar homeworld. Many of them are considered warrior stock for the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. There is a third, very small population of surviving mutants on Asteroid K, located in the Soul System, which is where Rasputin, Cardinal, and the others appear to be based. It's also worth noting here that there's brief mention of an Empress Sandra with big plans to potentially annex the Soul System. If we remember correctly, Sandra was the suspected progeny of Professor Charles Xavier and Empress Lalandra of the Shi'ar Empire, introduced in Kelly Thompson's Mr. and Mrs. X series. But what of Silabel's fate? We are introduced to the Tower of Nimrod the Lesser, the human machine monolith. We see Nimrod with a machine agent named Omega. Is this the Omega Sentinel we know to have been the machine liaison for Orcus? Or perhaps progeny or a variation of her AI? 
An allusion to her faith in humanity seems to suggest it, as their operatives return with Silabel in tow. It's important to note here that the humans are clearly subservient to Nimrod and the machine forces as they are seen bowing before them. Nimrod expresses a cold sort of humanity as he acknowledges the cruelty in producing hounds like Silabel, but nonetheless delights in the idea of giving her a bath to extract the necessary information from her. They need to find out how and why the mutants infiltrated their territory and accessed their mainframe. And to do it, Silabel will be submerged into a tank of femtofluid, where she will be suspended and distilled down to nothing but data. We learn of Nimrod's aspiration to curate a sort of library archiving a massive amount of mutant data this way, as a way for the machines to conquer mutants and flourish in a world that will be made theirs. And that takes us directly into 10 to the third power. Year 1000, The Ascension. Our scene opens on the archive of Nimrod the Greater, the mutant library. We see Silabel's still deteriorating body floating within its femtofluid chamber, the librarian lamenting that there is too much machinery floating around to salvage a soul or make a copy. A floating module takes blame for it, explaining that it wasn't built to maintain integrity for a millennium. The librarian absolves the module of guilt calling it Nimrod and telling it that by establishing a living database of mutants for advantage in the war was simply doing what was necessary, since no one at the time could have anticipated how useless this war was, or its surprising end. Nimrod expresses relief to be done with Homo sapiens, but the librarian explains that they can never be done with the past because they need something to remind them what they've overcome. Glimpsing into a dome habitat dubbed the Preserve, we see what appear to be two nude humans, a man and a woman, posed in such a way that is almost instantly recognizable as a museum exhibit, evocative of primitive civilization. The librarian ominously hopes to God that they never have dominion again. A reference to God closes this issue, much like how House of X issue 1 ended. But we're not quite done here. First, we must return to the tarot cards back in year 1. With our knowledge of who and what Rasputin, the Tower of Nimrod, and Cardinal are, we can approach the implications of placing them on these specific arcana. First up, the Magician. We see Rasputin moving through a solid wall, her greatsword in hand, one leg visibly emerging and the other still out of sight. The caption reads, See the Magician, the Metal Metamorph, the Great Sword, and the Girl with One Foot in Two Worlds. Traditionally, the Magician card features a male figure with his four ritual tools, a sword, a wand, a cup, and a pentacle. Overall, the card represents consciousness, rationality, logic, communication, and manifesting the intangible into the tangible world. The sword, specifically, stands for truth, justice, and rationality. The concept of bringing the intangible into the tangible world does relate to Rasputin in that the sword she holds looks very much like Ileana's soul sword, which she would bring into existence from another world. Ileana was very much a girl in two worlds, but is Rasputin? Tangibility also evokes thoughts of Kitty Pride, with whom Rasputin shares DNA. However, it is strange for Hickman to display Rasputin on a card that often represents rationality, because one could argue that Rasputin acted more emotionally than rationally when she charged in to save Silabel, potentially endangering a mission that was almost complete. Also, while a sword is present on this card, it is totally devoid of any of the other ritual tools that are crucial to the Arcana's identity. While we don't have a full understanding of Rasputin and her motivations, we could proffer the Six of Swords as a more relevant card to the caption in this panel. That card portrays people in a boat between two shores, suspended between states of being. It could relate to Rasputin's actions in that it's about making hard choices, deciding what to leave behind and what to take with you into the next stage of your life. Next up, the Tower. We see what we now know to be the Tower of Nimrod, the man-machine monolith, where Nimrod will amass an archive of mutant data harvested from their very bodies and minds. The tower looms over a cityscape in front of a swirling purple sky. The caption reads, See the tower, the axis, the pillar of collapse and rebirth, the monolith of ascension. Traditionally, the tower card represents war, chaos, and ruin. It features a tall, monolithic column burning from being struck by lightning, breaking in half, collapsing, and people falling to their death. On the flip side, it can also stand for a sort of release or breakthrough experienced upon such a collapse. War and ruin are certainly relevant to the presence of the tower in Powers of Ten Issue 1, in that the man-machine supremacy poses the main threat to mutant survival. From the mutant perspective, the tower is most certainly an appropriate representation of their fate. Also, the tower is not depicted as being destroyed, but perfectly erect, reaching proudly into the sky. 
one could suggest that the death or the judgment arcana could better symbolize the concept of rebirth or resurrection, respectively. And finally, the devil. We see who we now know to be the cardinal, the third generation outlier of the sinister line. The cardinal is a pacifist with a personality adjacent to religious sensibilities, obviously standing in stark contrast with the connotations that the devil brings. The caption reads, See the devil, the red god, and the lost cardinal of the last religion. Traditionally, the devil card represents temptation and corruption. It features Baphomet with one hand pointing upward and a torch pointed down, with a man and woman chained to his throne. Aside from sharing Nightcrawler's demonic appearance, there are almost no connections to be made with this specific card. Much like Rasputin on the Magician, almost every crucial element of the Arcana is missing here. One could argue that a more accurate representation of Cardinal would be the Hierophant card, which represents an interpreter of God, quite literally, a priest, as Cardinal is referred to in this issue. All of this made me feel like Hickman may be purposefully subverting the accepted meaning of the cards. I haven't read very much material by this writer, so I'm unaware of whether or not he tends to include this kind of divination symbolism in his work, but it strikes me as odd that the cards in these panels would be so blatantly contradictory of their tarot counterparts in so many places. It leads me to think that maybe there is a reason for this, or that we are about to see some huge changes made to these characters in the future of the series. After all, this tale is young, and we have so much more to learn in the coming installments. All we can do is keep diving in, and you can bet I'll be here to talk about it. I'd like to give a special thank you to my partner Jacob for helping me on the tarot segment of this video. If you're interested in checking out his studies of the cards, there will be a link to his website in the description below. But what did you think of Powers of Ten issue 1? Leave a comment with your thoughts, and please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you dig it and subscribe for more content. Say it with me, we are the Mutant Menace. Hey.